Well, a very good morning to you all on this rather damp, dirty December morning. It's good to have you back in church this morning after a, a two-week adjournment. Uh, it's good to be back in church, but uh, there's always uh, just the church building, but we the people are the church. We all must always remember that. Uh, and also, again, those of you looking online, uh, listening by telephone, it's good to have you join with us again this morning, wherever you're looking to join us from this service. I know there's many members of families uh, over in GB and even far off fields watching into the service, so we're very glad to see you joining with us again this morning. I want to give a very warm word of welcome to our interim moderator, the Reverend Gareth McFadden, Minister of Kilbride, Presbyterian Church. Uh, Gareth, we thank you for coming to take my service this morning, and we trust that uh, God will be speaking to us through your spoken words. And again, I want to say a word of thanks on behalf of you all to uh, Gareth. It's time for looking after past and needs and other uh, duties which the minister has to do in, in Johnson's absence at this time. So it's good to have you with us, uh, Gareth, at this time. Uh, one or two announcements, folks, again at this time of the year. Uh, can I ask all uh, committee members to call around the back to the session house to collect a, a Christmas box? Not for yourselves, but uh, uh, there's items to give out to your family districts over the next couple of weeks. So if you make your way around to the session house afterwards and just remember to keep social distancing and someone will be there to give out those uh, items to you at this time. And if you are not able to come today, or those of you maybe are not at church at this time, uh, if you call down tomorrow in the morning between 9.30 and uh, 10 a.m., someone will be there to give you out those uh, items uh, tomorrow morning, if you can do that. Um, one or two announcements. Uh, a recent um, committee meeting there, we gave uh, families the opportunity to, who have been unable to return their FW envelopes during the uh, present pandemic, an opportunity has been made available to do that next uh, Saturday morning, Saturday the 19th of December. If you come to church hall so between 11.30, sorry, between 9.30 and 11.30 a.m., someone will be there to receive your church offerings, only if you wish to do so. So that's next Saturday morning. Uh, an item there on Facebook, and Malcolm threw up this week there. Any family who wants to may make a wee uh, Christmas greeting message at this time, you can do so there if you follow the guidelines on Facebook. Or alternatively, if you come into this church building uh, next uh, Tuesday evening, that's Tuesday 15th, uh, and also Wednesday 23rd from 7 p.m., that message can be recorded here in the church if you wish to do that rather than pre-record your message at home. Um, again, it's uh, with sadness I have to report to you uh, the death of another uh, church member. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Nevin Houston died peacefully in the hospital on early on Friday morning after a, a, a long illness. Um, we passed on our sympathy to uh, Nevin's wife, Yandy, uh, Landy, uh, from Mark, daughter-in-law, Deidre, and grandson, Jimmy, at this sad time. And we remember them in our thoughts and prayers. There will be a deep side uh, uh, service this afternoon at 3 p.m. in the church here, church guard graveyard up behind me. And then again, I learned last night of the death of uh, Mr. Bobby Gordon, uh, the father of Alistair Gordon, who you recall was a pastoral, visitor, pa pastoral worker in the church for a couple of years. Uh, Bobby died, I understand, quite suddenly on, on uh, Saturday morning. So again, remember Alistair and his brothers and the wider family served at this sad time. And again, we pass on our sympathy and remember in our thoughts and prayers also. I think that that's all the announcements at this time, so I'll, I'll let you pass on to Gareth. Thank you, Gareth. James, thank you for your welcome, and it's good to be with you all. Uh, good morning, everybody. Those of you in the building and those of you tuning in in all the different fashions uh, later on. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. The Lord Jesus Christ has secured for us a wonderful inheritance, a gift beyond measure, 
If we are Christ's, then that gift is assuredly ours. And we are those who await his return when that reward will be brought in all its fullness. Advent is a time when we remember the waiting for Christ. Those who first awaited the coming of Messiah, those like us who await his second coming. We're going to now have uh, some items that are going to run through without announcement, the Advent reading, lighting of the candle, and then some images from the Sunday School. We'll flow straight into our first praise, which is, as with gladness, men of old. We're not singing all five verses of that. We're singing three. Just sing the verses that appear on the screen. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. Before we light the third candle, which symbolizes joy, we will light chapter 2, verses 10 to 14, of the joy of Jesus coming into the world as a baby. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy to, for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven of, of earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. Away in 
Let us pray. Lord God, you looked upon us from your holiness and purity, and you saw sin. You looked and saw us failing, and you saw us rebelling. And yet, you had mercy. The wonder of your undeserved mercy. It should raise within us the desire to shout joyfully praises to you. Forgive us, Lord, if we have belittled you and your word, perhaps even accidentally through the style of our response or the manner of our belief. Forgive us, Lord, if we have placed obstacles in the way of truly welcoming the Savior into your lives. In this service, we pray that you would highlight this to us if we have work to do, that we might clear the path for the Lord. Praise be to the Lord Jesus, because he has come and he has offered new birth and has offered a wonderful reward to all those who believe. May our hearts be so focused on you this Advent and Christmas, that Christ will truly be the centre of our lives and our churches. May we each wisely ensure we are ready for the last time when he will come with salvation for those who believe. May we ensure we are not counted among those who will receive judgment as those who refused him. Speak to our hearts, Lord, all of us. May we have that joyful reassurance that indeed our hearts are ready for Christ. In his name, amen. Well, I look at the, the church and I have seen some children and I hope there are some more who are listening at home. And I wonder what you're waiting on at Christmas time. I'm sure it has something to do with getting nice envelopes. I've got some lovely envelopes here. I got a nice selection of envelopes this Christmas time. Lots of them have my name on them. There's the beautiful red ones. I've got two red ones. Uh, I've got a lovely collection of envelopes back home. And I saved these ones especially so that you could see. That at Christmas time, people like to give each other envelopes. It's great. And at Christmas time, people give each other paper. Have you noticed that? Sometimes they'll stuff the paper inside a box. Sometimes they'll wrap the paper around the box. At Christmas time, people give each other paper. You'll have so much paper, you could fill two or three bin bags in Christmas morning with paper. People like to give paper at Christmas. And then, of course, one of the favorite things that people give at Christmas is boxes. Everybody likes to get boxes at Christmas. Box, this is a really nice box. It's got a nice pattern on it. It shuts nice and firm. It doesn't have any sticky old tape on it. This is a really good box. Somebody gave my daughter this box, and she was well pleased with it. She let me borrow it just so you could see the nice box. So, boxes, envelopes, and paper. I'm sure, children, you're really excited about Christmas. I'm sure the adults are looking forward to boxes, envelopes, and paper too. <laughs> but, of course, you know I'm being daft. Uh, this box actually had a beautiful thing inside it. And the paper was there just to make sure that it stayed safe. And, of course, people don't send me envelopes at Christmas. They send me cards. Sometimes, if I'm really happy, there might be something inside the card. They send me cards and the envelopes, just the packaging, and the box and the paper, just the packaging. And we want those things to be as nice as possible, but Christmas isn't about boxes, paper and envelopes. It's about the cards and the gifts and the love that came inside them. But actually, Christmas is about even more than that. Because, you know, even if we get excited about the food and the presents and the cards. And we think we've done better than being daft and excited about boxes and envelopes. We have to set those bits to the side of touch as well. Because we've been reminded already in our service, Christmas 
is about Jesus. And when we are only excited about food and presents and cards, we're not that much better than if we were only excited about envelopes, boxes and paper. Jesus is who we really should be remembering at Christmas time. And children at home and in church, and those of you who put those lovely pieces of craft in for us to see in the pictures, I hope you remember. This is the year we remember, or the time of year we remember, our Saviour came, Jesus. I'm going to pray for the children, and then we're going to watch a video about the moderator's Christmas appeal. Lord Jesus, help us to remember you this Christmas time. To not be distracted by cards, presents, food, and all the good stuff, and forget the best of all, the Son of God, come as our Saviour. Help us not to be silly about the most important thing, neglecting it entirely. We would never do that with any other gift, getting more excited about the box than the gift itself. So teach us not to be more excited about Christmas and all that comes with it and forget to be excited about you. Speak to our hearts, young and old, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now the moderator. Twenty twenty will be remembered in history as the year of the coronavirus pandemic. As I speak to you today, there have been an estimated fifty million cases of this disease, and well over a million people have lost their lives as a direct result of infection. The effect on the economies of the more fragile and low income nations of the world is multiplied. Healthcare systems have fallen apart under unbearable pressure, and tens of millions of daily wage earners have simply lost their jobs, and we have witnessed the vulnerability of 65 million refugees and internally displaced people for whom home is currently a densely populated camp or detention centre. COVID-19 has been wreaking havoc and undoing decades of development work in so many parts of the world. Today, therefore, I am launching a moderator's appeal towards the ongoing and broad-ranging COVID-19 emergency relief effort. I'm taking this opportunity to encourage our church members to respond as generously as they have on many previous occasions. Any funds donated to this appeal will be distributed between PCI's Relief and Development Partners, Christian Aid and Tear Fund, who are already engaged in longer-term sustainable development work amongst those most affected by COVID-19, and they're well-placed to direct additional efforts to combat the crisis. In addition, we will donate to PCI's partner churches in South Sudan, Malawi, Indonesia, Nepal, Lebanon, Syria and Romania. There is much more detailed information about all of this on the PCI website, which I encourage you to look at. And this includes the ways in which your gifts can be contributed. Now, of course, COVID-19 has had a major impact here at home on the island of Ireland. And I know at first hand the unprecedented demands already placed on our congregations. Yet I believe Presbyterians will value this opportunity to respond as we approach Christmas and New Year together. We are a people who have been shaped over the years by faithful prayer, deep compassion and practical concern for those in need as well as sacrificial giving when faced by emergencies which come before us. So, I have no hesitation in commending this appeal to your prayerful response and encouraging you to play your part in saving lives and restoring hope to people 
in the worst affected countries of the world. Thank you. Well, a very clear and positive message from our moderator. Uh, this year is different from previous years. Uh, our Presbyterian Church in Ireland would normally at this time of year be putting a special focus on what we call the World Development Appeal. Uh, this special moderator's coronavirus appeal replaces that this year. And so there will be opportunity for you to give to this special appeal. Uh, next week's our carol service and we'll have opportunity for you to give then. Uh, and of course, if you are unable to attend and wish to give uh, and you're at home, uh, making sure that you mark a donation clearly, that it's for the moderator's Christmas appeal, uh, then that can be put into the funds also. This is important. There are so many issues surrounding coronavirus and how we have to live with it. Even today, we sit in church and you're wearing face coverings and it's difficult. Or many of you are restrained from coming to church and it's difficult. Uh, and we can complain and sometimes it's okay to complain because it is aggravating. And some of us have maybe been unwell or know someone who has been. And so this can stretch our patience and our joy. But the moderator has called us to something positive and good, to move beyond our discomfort and to help those who are in need. That's the call on the Christian. Let us pray. Lord God, as we prepare to celebrate the coming of our Lord Jesus, may we remember the needs of others around us who have suffered due to the coronavirus pandemic. Lord God, we pray for those who have been recently bereaved. May the comfort of your Holy Spirit surround them and give them strength to carry on. For those who are facing sickness, heartache, hunger, job loss, may you break through with your love that they may know the Lord God who brings and who sent his son to be a light in the midst of darkness. For those who face financial problems in these COVID-19 times, may the hearts of others be moved to assist when there genuinely is need of support. Those who are elderly, living on their own, Lord, we pray that you would provide friendship and help and that you would prompt us did you prompt us, the church, to be proactive in connecting with and loving those who belong to this fellowship so that we would know that people are being kept safe, warm, healthy, rather than just hope? Help us be people who make sure. And Lord, may this Christmas 2020 time Help us remember the needs of others, not only locally, but globally in this pandemic. We offer our prayers in support of them and soon our financial support to them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40. And verses 1 to 11. Isaiah 40, 1 to 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your Lord. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. That her sin has been paid for that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins, a voice of one calling, in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord 
has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fail, but the word of the Lord stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, Lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, Here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently tends those who have young. This is the word of the Lord, and we pray that he would open our hearts today to receive his good words for us. Amen. Well, I wonder, are you ready for Christmas yet? It's a strange year and hard to answer that question this year of all years. But of course, we're in Advent, and this is the third week of Advent. The season in the Christian calendar when we traditionally pause and make ready. We make ready with two views. We reflect on what it was like for the people who awaited the first coming of the Messiah. And we remember that we as Christians await his second coming. When he will take all those who are his to their eternal reward. It is a time of waiting. A time of preparation. And so we ask rightly, are you ready and waiting for him? Is there room in your Christmas and in your heart for Christ? Today's passage, written centuries before the coming of Christ, has a vital message for us. It has us ask, are you prepared for the coming Messiah? Are you ready to meet him? And it tells us to prepare our hearts. So today we ask, are you ready? Are you ready for Christ? Verses 1 to 5, prepare the way. Prepare the way. Isaiah covers difficult days as the Jews have been taken into exile across the desert and into Babylon. That's now referred to as modern-day Iraq. Why had that happened to them? Well, it's because they had rejected God. They had refused to obey his word. So imagine these words which are in Isaiah 40. How they would have sounded to the people who first heard them. In the desert, there's a voice crying, Prepare the way, because God is coming. Can you imagine the hope that would have stirred within them when they heard that the first time? Folk songs from our part of the world uh, sometimes are lovely, but they often betray a sense of hopelessness. If you notice that, the ocean is too wide, the distance is too great, and some poor soul that used to come from these shores can't get home to where they used to be. And so we've got songs like My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, or... I wish I was in Carrick Fergus. Only for nights in the Valley uh, Valley Grand, I would swim over the deepest ocean. Only for nights in the Valley Grand. But the sea is wide, and I cannot swim over, and neither have I the wings to fly. I wish I had a handsome boatsman to ferry me over my love and I. I lived in Larne for a few years, and I only heard that song whenever I'd already left East Antrim. I wish I was in Carrick Fergus. I sometimes thought that whenever I was in a traffic jam trying to get out of Belfast. But of course, there's a sense of a cry. This person wants to be home. That's what the folk song means. They want to be home. The Jews also had their songs that cried out their 
their longing to be home. Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. So the Jews weren't saying as they were in Babylon, I wish I was in Carrickfergus. They were saying, I wish I was in Jerusalem. That longing to be home. The exiles were in desperate longing. And then these words came to them. Oh, imagine how it stirred their hearts. Verses 1 to 2 of our reading. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. And God did bring them back from Babylon after 70 years of exile. But Isaiah 40 looks even beyond that. It looks beyond to a full restoration, forgiven sins, full reconciliation with God. A powerful and unique intervention was coming, even greater than leaving Babylon and going to Jerusalem. Verses 3 to 5. A voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. In ancient days, if an emperor visited an area, there would be preparations. Roads would be mended and straightened, obstacles removed, bumps evened out, so that the wheels of the emperor's chariots wouldn't catch. You would prepare the way. Isaiah 40 is pointing toward a greater event than the return from the exile to Jerusalem. You can actually read about that having happened in the Old Testament book of Ezra. But in those days, even when a group of people returned, these things spoken of in Isaiah didn't happen. There was not the glorious entrance of the Lord. All mankind together did not see it. Something greater was coming. The Jews knew it. And in the days of John the Baptist, centuries later, part of this longing for a fuller restoration was unfolding. Because the Messiah was coming. And he fulfills these words of Isaiah 40. When John the Baptist came in Isaiah 40, we read in Mark 1, it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. So how do we know Isaiah 40 is fulfilled with John the Baptist proclaiming the coming Messiah? Well, Mark tells us that's how we know. John the Baptist called the people to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. How were they to prepare this way? Not physically by removing rocks and stones from the ground. It's a metaphor and he makes clear practically what it is to be in Mark 1 verse 4. John the Baptist preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That was the preparation. Without repentance and forgiveness of sins, we know we are not right with God. That's the first step in receiving Christ. And so, how is a human heart prepared? Think on that metaphor in Isaiah, also picked up in Mark. 
a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. Think of those words and think of your heart. What in your heart, this Christmas time, might benefit from clearing? How can you prepare the way to freshly meet with Christ? Or, for some of us, for the very first time. For some, there's a wilderness of religion. You need a highway for God so that you can truly meet the Messiah. For some, there is a deep valley of despair or pain or a loss of some sort. And the the pain of that is immense and it has become a blockage between you and God. That valley needs raised up, filled in. Don't let it get in the way anymore. For some, there's the mountain of pride. The stubborn refusal to let go of ideas that you picked up. The refusal to change even when scripture gives you the right way. That mountain of pride needs flattened. What rough places of sin need repented of? Some of us have maybe laid an obstacle course between us and Christ. An Advent is a reminder that we are told, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Even Christians' lives can become entangled and messy and filled with obstacles so that this unhindered, joyful life of walking with Christ is not fully enjoyed. Prepare the way. Clear the path. Get those obstacles. Are you ready to meet Christ? Our second point, verses 6 to 8. Prepare your heart. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fail because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fail. But the word of our God stands forever. It is tempting for religious people to rely on self-goodness. And that's sometimes seen with a holier-than-thou attitude or misguided reliance on goodness, decency, and church membership and those sorts of things. Isaiah 40 was, was partly fulfilled whenever John the Baptist said, prepare your heart. We are to get our heart straight with God, not just our external straight in the eyes of other people. None of us can or should take confidence in our own ability to stand before God. We know that. We are grass, verse 6. And grass burns up under the fire of testing. What stands forever? God's word. Believe what he said. Trust his words to you. Prepare your heart so that you can stand before God based on the clear teaching of his word. Soak in that word so that it gives you that assurance in your heart of where you are with him. Prayerfully read it. Respond to the truth in it. I suggest if this is a new a concept to you that you set out and read Mark's gospel, the shortest and simplest of all the four gospels. Read it. Don't stop till you get to the 16th chapter. When you do, give me a phone call and I'll give you your next assignment. Open your heart to the truth of the gospel as it appears in God's word. Or refresh your heart with a renewed Cleansing, saturation within that good word. And don't listen to distortions or substitutions that come from what I might mischievously call today grass teachers. 
You know, we're told here in verses 68 that we're like grass and the grass withers. But the word of God stands forever. Don't listen to grass teachers. Listen to God's word. Prepare your heart. Prepare your heart that way. And then lastly, prepare for your reward. Prepare for your reward. Isaiah 40 is a passage of gladness in a book well supplied with woe and doom. The proclaimer of God's salvation is to go up on a high mountain and let the word out. Zion, a name for Jerusalem, was going to see salvation. It was to be shouted out confidently. And how would it happen? Well, they were told that God would come in power and he would bring a reward with him. Verse 10. The reward would be for his own, those who have prepared for him. Those who ensured their heart was prepared for the God's Messiah. This part of Isaiah 40 remains to be fully fulfilled. For when Christ comes and all will see him, he brings his reward with him that day. And those who have not yet gone to meet him will meet him that day. No doubt. All will. All will. Colossians 1, 27 to 28. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people and he will appear a second time. Not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. That is to be our stance. Verse 11 says the Lord will care for his people like a shepherd cares for his sheep. And remember John 10 verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We know Jesus is saying in advance there in John 10 that his death would be his way of caring for his sheep by dying for him. He brought his reward of eternal life then. He came to save. His glory has been revealed. His glory will be revealed perfectly one day. And we do not know when. So clear the path. Prepare your heart. And be ready for him. To receive that gift. Eternal life. A reward granted to those who trust in Jesus Christ. Prepare your heart to receive the reward and ensure when he comes to judge, for he will judge, that he says to you, come, you are mine. The prophets foretold a day when the Messiah would come. John the Baptist was really the last of those prophets. And he proclaimed the mission of the Messiah, preaching a message of repentance and calling people to prepare to meet the Messiah. We are ready if we have repented. We are ready if we have sought that forgiveness of our sins through faith in Christ's death and resurrection. When we've done that, the path in our heart is clear. Now, Christian, have you cluttered it up a wee bit since you made that decision for Christ? I think we all easily can. Losing that enthusiastic faith. Drifting from prayerfulness. Not being in our scripture. Not being bothered about worship. Yes, even when he does know Christ. The path the obstacles can gather again. And it doesn't mean our salvation is took away. But it does mean there's work to do. And for some of us, maybe today, maybe Isaiah speaks to your heart. You need to open up for the first time for your Christ to bring salvation. 
Lord God, grant to us open hearts to receive your word today. Whether we are those who do know Christ or whether we are those who acknowledge today we don't, may we prepare the way for the Lord to receive salvation for that first time, perhaps, or to rededicate our lives, recognizing there may have been drift and neglect, even amongst faith. Lord, this Christmas time, we offer ourselves fully to Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. And we conclude our worship. Joy to the world. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.